So, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so, I'll be giving uh, some preliminary information on the long term trends in the catch biology and diet of tiger sharks, uh, caught in the bank of protection here of the Cambrian Shark Course between 1978 and 2014. Now, species specific long term trends are seldom available for any large species which aren't targeted commercially. Now, the absence of logbook records. Shark control programs provide a very, very important long-term data set. Now, this is perhaps particularly important for a species like tiger sharks. One, because it was a species to which attacks were historically critical. Two, as an apex predator, um, changes in its abundance will undoubtedly have a cascading effect to the rest of the ecosystem. And three, this species become a very, very important dive attraction at the nearby reefs of Alley Shoal and Protea Banks. Now, despite all of this, very little research, surprisingly, has been conducted on tiger sharks. And in fact, the previous studies to date have been limited to an ancient growth study back in 2000, and a sort of very generic catch trend uh, paper back in 2006. So, for those who don't know, that's what a tiger shark looks like. They grow up to five and a half meters. It's one of the uh, most readily identifiable shark species with its dark blotches and black stripes along the side of its body. Now, worldwide, tiger sharks are found in uh, tropical and warm temperate waters, uh, both coastal and Atlantic waters. In the West Indian Ocean, they're found from the Red Sea around Madagascar down to South Africa and South Africa. You find them from the Mozambique border as far south as the Breda River. Worldwide, the IUCN lists uh, tiger sharks as near threatened, and that, that's based on declining population trends in many parts of the world. In America, the population has declined by up to 65%. In the West Indian Ocean, there's no real sort of focus fishing for tiger sharks. There's, to a limited uh, extent, some uh, artisanal fishing in places like Mozambique. That's where that photo was taken of the juvenile tiger shark. But probably the main source of fishing mortality is the case of shark's broad nets, where it's one of the 14 most commonly caught species. So, again, for those that don't know, the case of shark's board, we operate over about 320 kilometers from Richards Bay in the north down to, uh, down to Port Edward in the south. Those two nets have been removed. <coughs> Now we operate at 38 uh, netted beaches where we use a combination of nets and drum lines to catch sharks. So this is what the nets look like. They're on average about 212 metres long, 6 metres deep with a strip to mesh of 51 centimetres. Now shark nets have been incredibly effective at reducing the risk of shark attack. There's only been four non-fatal attacks at any netted beach in over 50 years. But unfortunately they do catch uh, unwanted bycatch. So, to try and reduce that, we started to introduce drum lines at a lot of our beaches. We use drum lines at a replacement ratio of four drum lines to replace one net. And those drum lines, of course, don't inadvertently catch a lot of bycatch species. This is what the drum lines look like. It's basically an anchored float with a 14 OJ hook, which is baited. We introduced drum lines uh, initially in 2005 at Richards Bay, where we put three drum lines in, and we've now put drum lines at 17 of our 18 big features here along the Hibiscus Coast, where we've removed four kilometres of netting. So, in fact, in the mid 90s, we had up to 45 kilometres of nets, we've now got 22 kilometres. So, there's been a huge net reduction, and drum lines are one of those things we've used to reduce them. So, Looking at some catch trends, I'll look at the catch trends in the nets and the drum line separately because obviously they operate in a very, very different manner to one another. We standardise um, catch as the number of sharks per kilometre of net due to this variation in the length of netting over the 37 years of the study period. And we can see quite clearly there's a significant increase in catch of tiger sharks along the, the KZN coastline from about one per kilometre of net in, in 1978 to about two uh, per kilometre of net in uh, 2014. And interestingly, this is the only species of shark that we catch in our um, safety gear that's actually shown an increase in trend. 
They sought the time sharks are a lot more resilient to fishing pressure than many shark species as possible, but in a multi-species system, which is subjected to um, a bait protection program, the tiger sharks might enjoy some competitive advantage. Interestingly, in both the New South Wales and Queensland shark protection programs, or bait protection programs in Australia, they've both seen a significant decline in catch rate of tigers. So certainly the data at the moment suggests a very, very healthy, locally increasing population of tiger sharks along the KZN coastline. Looking at drum lines, well, drum lines have they been in, this is just looking at uh, the hibiscus post, that was zone, zone four that I showed you earlier. Have they been in for seven years? It's a pretty flat trend. There's, there's no trend really uh, evident with the drum lines. Now, one of the big criticisms we have about introducing drum lines along the coastline is as a baited, as a piece of bait with a hook, as a hook with a bit of big bait on it, do drum lines bring large sharks close to the shore? All right, so if that was the case, you would expect the catch of tiger sharks in nets adjacent to drum lines should be a lot higher now in the last seven years since drum deployment to the seven years post them being deployed. However, if we look with, um, oh sorry, if we look with um, a standard uh, two sample t-test, we see there's, well there's actually a decrease in the catch unit effort of tiger sharks in the nets adjacent to drums after they've been deployed. We've also modeled this with the general additive model and the take home message is that the drum lines in no way are causing an increase in tiger sharks close in shore. So there's no evidence for that whatsoever. I've actually done this with bull sharks and white sharks as well. And again, the results are very clear that the drum lines are not attracting those three potentially dangerous sharks in shore. Looking at survival rates since the 1970s, the Sharks Board had a, um, started implementing strict release policy on any sharks that were caught and still alive. And by the 1990s, everything that was caught and was still alive is released. And we can see that survival rate's been pretty constant since 1990, since we've had the strict uh, release policy. The red dots are the release, uh, the survival rate of the sharks and the drums. And we can see the net survival rate, we're looking at almost 40% survival rate of tigers on the nets and just over 30% survival rate from the drums. So tiger sharks, one of those species, almost half of them are being released alive. So even though there's been an increase in the abundance of tiger sharks close in shore, because of the, the net reduction that we've had and our increase in releasing live sharks once they're caught, we're actually now catching, we're actually now killing 20% less tiger sharks now than we did 30 years ago. So it's still, still killing too many, but certainly we're going in the right direction. So looking at the size distribution of sharks caught. So this one here is looking for the nets, and this one is the drums. So we, there's a couple of very obvious points. Firstly, we can see the distribution size of the sharks caught is unimodal in both the nets and the drum lines. Now, tiger sharks are born roughly at 60 centimeters, and they mature roughly at about 270 centimeters. So what we can see straight away is we're catching less than 1% of the sharks we catch at the end of the year, and less than 2% of the sharks we catch are mature. So clearly that our coastline is not a pupping, mating, or gestating area for tiger sharks. The other thing we can see that black lions are female. We're catching almost twice as many female than male sharks. Now the in vitro um, relationship between males and females is pretty much one to one. So clearly we're seeing a segregation of the population and I'm presuming that the male sharks are either further offshore or further north. Now, male and female sharks eat the same food, so again, this segregation is probably driven by 
some environmental preferences, maybe water temperature. The other thing we can clearly see, the median size of sharks for the nets is about 190 centimeters, whereas on the drums it's about 125 centimeters. The nets catch significantly bigger sharks than the drum lines. Now interestingly, that's not the same in Queensland, Australia, which also uses mixed gear. The, what I think is happening is we use very, very small bait on our drum lines, whereas in Queensland they use very large shark products on their hooks. So it's probably a case that these small baits we're using just aren't advertising to tiger sharks, hence we cash in fewer and much smaller sharks. And that's a problem for us because the drum lines aren't catching the target size of sharks that we would consider potentially dangerous to bathers. So we would never, certainly with this species, be able to replace all of our nets with drum lines because the drum lines aren't catching the target size that we're after. Looking at the size distribution, this is actually a significant increase in size over the last 37 years, which again is indicative of a very healthy local population of tiger sharks. The drum lines, that's a non-significant decrease. They've only been in the water for seven years, so we're not going to read too much into that. Looking at their spatial distribution, so going from Richards Bay to Port Edward with our four zones, there's a very, very slight decrease in the median size of sharks, with larger sharks being more common to the north and reducing in size as progressing down the coast. Looking at how they're distributed along the coast, we can see that there's a, a very, very clear preference that tiger sharks are exhibiting for this zone here, that zone three. And they're particularly abundant at um, sites 20 and 21. That's Scotland and Park Riley. Now, one of the things I think that explains that is that annual shoal which many of you know is sitting over about here, it's a very, very productive offshore reef with a very, very abundant food supply. And it's possible that the tiger sharks are showing preference for these inshore areas here because of the abundant and constant food supply due to the proximity of animal shoal. Because being a tropical species, you would expect you know, tiger sharks to be much more abundant in the warmer waters, in the warmer waters to the north. But they're not. Looking at their seasonal distribution, tiger sharks are found um, they're more common in the spring and summer, but tiger sharks are found along our coast throughout the year. And if we look, certainly just the temperature is one environmental variable. We see that temperature drops quite markedly during the winter months in KZM. So we can see the temperature certainly isn't triggering any mass movement of tiger sharks away from the Kensington coastline, which again suggests that these tiger sharks are not resident, but that they're probably inhabiting the Kensington coastline throughout the year, across an abundant and suitable um, food supply. How much time have I got? All right, looking at movement, movement patterns. So, we try and tag every shark that we release alive with a spaghetti tag. We tag 486 of them. It's a fairly low recapture rate of 4.7%. This is perhaps not surprising. Tiger sharks are very wide moving. They have a very large home range. Um, so we wouldn't expect to recapture as many animals as we would for maybe more sedentary species like regatoo sharks. So looking at the distance moved over time, we can see even after a period of up to five years, we're recapturing tiger sharks in the same place they were originally tagged. So there's slight evidence to maybe determine that tiger sharks are possibly philopatric to the case of the coastline. And in fact, 87% of all sharks that we caught were recaptured within 150 kilometers. So it looks like we've got a fairly resident population and maybe more transient individuals. Of the three recaptures that were over 150 k's, this is them here. One was recorded in Port Elizabeth, one um, in the Mozambique Channel, and one off the Madagascar coast. Now all of these sharks, 
180 centimeters, uh, 180 centimeters, 175 centimeters. The tiger sharks are only maturing at 270 centimeters. Clearly, these sharks are not making these movement patterns for any reproductive activities. It's probably as they're growing, they're expanding their home range, looking for new foraging grounds for suitable food. Just very quickly, looking at the 50% um, maturity. In our study, 50 maturity is about 250 centimeters. That equates to an age of eight. With the females maturing at 270 centimeters, which works out to 11 years old. Now, interestingly, there's a recent study in Hawaii which suggests that tiger sharks can actually mature in as quick as three years. So it's interesting that our tiger sharks possibly, so say it's an old Asian growth study, but these are estimated to be 8 and 11 years for males and females to mature. Just wrapping up, we've never caught a pregnant shark in our safety gear, but we did catch one pregnant female on a long line that was put in in the 1980s to catch a white shark after a shark attack. Now that shark had, I think it was 17 embryos, some of which were near term. Now the timing of capture of that shark, together with a pregnant female in reunion, suggests that pupping is not happening off the KZN coastline, but somewhere in the West Indian Ocean, it's happening probably in the austral summer. <coughs> Just very quickly, tiger sharks, garbage bins of the sea, they pretty much eat anything. 920 tiger sharks were dissected. Just gives you an idea of some of the species that they're uh, feeding on. Some of the more interesting ones, little diker, flushed down the river, tiger sharks scoffed at hole, uh, gannets, We've, all, we've even actually had uh, racing pigeon rings come out of the stomach. We've had two-minute noodle packets come out of the stomach of tiger sharks. They pretty much eat anything. There's a monitor lizard, porcupine fish, some form of rat. They pretty much eat anything and everything. So, to wrap things up, we can see that there's increasing Caspian effort along the KZN coastline, which suggests an increase in population. There's no evidence at all that drum lines are attracting large, potentially dangerous sharks close inshore. The drum lines, unfortunately, are not catching the target size of tiger sharks that we consider potentially dangerous to people. So we would always have to have a mixed gear approach protecting the KZN coastline. And from the size class of sharks we're catching, we can clearly see that the KZN coastline is not a mating, pupping, or gestating area for tiger sharks. So, based on those conclusions, some of the questions that they raise, really the next step for us is to get a better idea of the wide-ranging movement patterns of tiger sharks, and really get a better idea of the connectivity of tiger sharks throughout the West Indian Ocean. Now, that will help us to identify the pupping, gestation, and mating grounds, but it will also, perhaps more importantly, give us an idea as to whether the local increases in sharks that we're observing off the KZN coastline, are they actually indicative of the much wider population as a whole? <laughs>